Canada is a world leader in atomic technology. She is developing new ways of harnessing atomic energy for peaceful purposes. Atomic Energy of Canada Limited is the government agency responsible for nuclear research, development and production. Under its program, there has been a tremendous increase in the knowledge and use of atomic energy. Research has produced isotopes for medicine, agriculture and industry. And advances in design and engineering have resulted in economic nuclear power plants. It all starts with uranium. Here at the El Dorado refinery in Port Hope, uranium ores from northern mines are chemically processed to produce uranium metal. This metal is the key to Canada's growing nuclear program. Uranium is immensely powerful. This one inch cube weighs a pound. It contains as much energy as 1,500 tons of coal and Canada is rich in uranium. Along the rim of the Canadian Shield are large uranium-bearing areas that hold more than a third of the world's supply of the precious metal. Uranium is constantly disintegrating, atom by atom. This relentless process of natural radioactivity can be measured with a Geiger counter. But uranium gives no visible sign of its great store of hidden energy, except when it is in a cloud chamber. Here, particles from disintegrating atoms leave tracks like vapor trails. One of the unseen particles released from uranium is the neutron. Neutrons are released by the spontaneous splitting of uranium atoms. These neutrons are moving too fast to split more uranium atoms. But if these fast neutrons are slowed down, they will split the uranium nuclei in their way releasing still more neutrons. A chain reaction results, creating a great deal of heat. So when two uranium rods are placed side by side, there is no chain reaction, because the neutrons are traveling too fast. Something must be put between the rods to moderate the speed of the neutrons. Heavy water is the most efficient moderator. It slows the neutrons to produce the chain reaction and the resulting heat. The difference between heavy water and ordinary water is that in ordinary water, the hydrogen atom has an electron whirling about a nucleus of one proton. In heavy water, the hydrogen atom has a nucleus of one proton and one neutron. In ordinary water, only one atom in every 6,000 is heavy hydrogen. Production plants to separate heavy water from ordinary water are being built in Canada by private industry. This model demonstrates how Canadian atomic reactors work. Uranium rods are positioned in a tank which can be filled with heavy water. Nothing happens until the heavy water is introduced. Then, as the water level rises, the chain reaction begins. The number of neutrons multiplies. There is a powerful neutron bombardment, gamma radiation, and tremendous heat. The reaction can be slowed down by lowering the level of the heavy water moderator. This tank can only be seen in a model. All that can be seen of a real reactor is the outside of the concrete shields, which protect the staff and instruments from heat and radiation. This is Canada's NRX reactor. It was put into operation at Chalk River in 1947. The core of the reactor is the 10-foot high aluminum tank. In it are 180 fuel rods, each containing 120 pounds of uranium. The total fuel load of the NRX reactor is 10 and a quarter tons of uranium. The tank containing the fuel is shielded by a graphite neutron reflector, cast iron, and concrete. There are openings in the shielding which channel beams of neutrons into experimental apparatus. On the other side of the tank are the self-serve units used in the production of radioactive isotopes. 
A wide variety of radioactive isotopes is made at NRX for use in medicine, industry, and agriculture. The material which is to become a radioactive isotope is packed in an aluminum capsule. This is placed in an aluminum ball. The ball is dropped into an inlet. This model shows how the ball is placed close to the reactor vessel. The neutron storm in the reactor makes the material in the ball into a radioactive isotope. When the material has been exposed the required length of time, a few hours or a few weeks, the ball is rolled out into a shielded container. The radiation from these isotopes can be detected and measured. This makes them extremely useful in a variety of applications. For example, in forestry, isotopes in solution provide information about the growth and structure of trees. Injected into a tree, these isotopes, called tracers, enter the tree's circulatory system and flow with the sap up the tree to the leaves. This leaf, filled with radioactive tracer, recorded its own picture when it was placed on a photographic plate. The most dramatic development in isotopes is the use of cobalt-60 in cancer therapy machines. Atomic Energy of Canada Limited designed this medical equipment. Its commercial products group in Ottawa builds the machines and installs them around the world. It also markets irradiators, which sterilize medical supplies and preserve food. Canadian-built sterilization plants are in operation here and in foreign countries. The highly radioactive cobalt-60 must be handled in a heavily shielded room called a hot cave. The room's window is made of high-density glass, three feet thick. About three ounces of cobalt-60 are placed in the container that will go into the head of the cancer therapy machine. This container is packed for shipping in a lead-lined case that weighs two and a quarter tons. These capsules are sent to clinics in France, Italy, Brazil, England, and many other countries. Canada exports nuclear technology, too. At Chalk River, engineers and physicists from India and Canada work together. The constructive use of the atomic knowledge they have gained can be a unifying force in the world a force that can improve living conditions for people everywhere. India's Cyrus Research Reactor, a Canadian model, stands on the shores of the Arabian Sea. The two nations built it together under the Colombo Plan. Rajasthan in northwest India is the site of a nuclear power station designed by Canadians. The Indian Department of Atomic Energy built the station.
At Chalk River, fundamental research continues. Physicists use accelerators to bombard atoms with high-speed particles. The particles passing through these accelerators reach energies of 20 million electron volts or more. The beams of particles are bent 90 degrees with a magnet into a room containing the target material. Here, physicists set up the complex apparatus used to collect information about the structure of the atom. Chuck River is also the home of NRU, a powerful research reactor. NRU is about the same size as NRX, and it burns about the same amount of fuel. But its improved design produces five times the density of neutrons for isotope production and research. The NRU reactor attracts many visitors. Among them are hundreds of high school and university students, Canada's future scientists. And the amount of heat that is generated in this NRU reactor is 200 million watts. Now that's like the amount of energy that's released from 2 million 100 watt lamps. A great deal of research equipment is connected to NRU. These pipes are part of the apparatus for power loop experiments. Experimental fuel rods for power stations are tested in separate coolant systems to determine how they will perform under high pressure and intense radiation. NRU was the first reactor in the world to change a fuel rod without shutting down. This development was significant for nuclear power stations, for it allowed them to transmit power without interruption. The fueling machine moves over the storage bay to pick up a fuel rod in the basement below. An operator oversees the rod change. He is in direct contact with the control room. Station 23, call the control room. Station 23, calling station one, shift supervisor, please. Come in, 23. The flask is centered, ready for changing the fuel rod to position F9. The all main pumps are operating, normal flow over the weir, carry on with the rod change. The rod has entered the reactor tank without interrupting the operation of the reactor. Rod work is complete. Now moving the flask off the reactor. Canada's atomic energy program started here at Chalk River, and much of the research and isotope production is still centered here. But the program has expanded. Now there are nuclear power stations at Rolfton and Douglas Point, and two more being built at Gentilly and Pickering. There's a manufacturing center for medical and industrial equipment at Ottawa, a design center at Sheridan Park, and the White Shell Research Laboratory at Pinawa. Rolfton is the site of Canada's first nuclear power plant, the nuclear power demonstration known as NPD. This generating plant was built with the knowledge gained from the experiments at Chuck River. The reactor tank at NPD was not installed in a vertical position like the ones in NRX and NRU. It operates in a horizontal position. The fuel rods are in zirconium alloy pressure tubes which are surrounded by the heavy water moderator. 
The heavy water coolant flows over the hot uranium rods and transfers the heat to a steam generator. There, the heat turns ordinary water into steam. The steam drives a turbine connected to a generator, which produces 20,000 kilowatts of electricity. This small pioneer station at Rolfton, Ontario, proved that Canada's heavy water moderator system is highly successful. The training of Canadian and foreign operators for the growing nuclear industry is carried on here. For NPD is the prototype for the larger plants, like Canada's first full-scale nuclear power station, Douglas Point. The reactor at Douglas Point was designed to produce 200,000 kilowatts of electric power, 10 times the output of NPD. This new plant can generate enough power for a city the size of Ottawa. Douglas Point's reactor is controlled by a digital computer, the first to be used in a Canadian power station. Private industry is playing an increasingly large role in the atomic energy program. It manufactures many of the components for nuclear facilities. The fuel bundles used at Douglas Point are made up of pellets of uranium dioxide. These pellets are packed in thin-walled zircaloy tubes. Nineteen of these tubes make a bundle, a convenient shape for loading into the reactor. The reactor holds about 60 tons of uranium dioxide in its 3,672 fuel bundles. This fuel stays two to three years in the reactor before being replaced. The Douglas Point plant went into operation in 1966. It now feeds power into the Ontario Hydro grid. Experiments with new fuels and coolants are performed at the White Shell Research Center at Pinawa, Manitoba. The WR1 reactor is a versatile unit for applied research. Here, used fuel bundles are removed from the reactor with the aid of a fueling machine. Scientists and engineers are developing alloys that stand up well under the conditions inside a reactor. Intense radiation, heat and pressure and organic materials are being tested as coolants. Spent fuel bundles are transported in special containers from the reactor to the research building.
Here, in the hot caves of the research building, the fuel bundles can be opened and examined. The experiments with cladding materials, fuels, and coolants are aimed at increasing the effectiveness of nuclear power stations to reduce the cost of electricity. Nuclear power stations are designed and their components tested at the Sheridan Park Laboratory in Toronto. This development laboratory was opened in October 1966. Experiments are being performed to determine flow patterns in reactor tanks. A drop of oil is put into the water and its course is plotted on a chart. The resulting information is used in the design of moderator systems. The performance of a spray cooling system is being tested in a full-scale mock-up. The system is designed to cool the tubes and walls of a reactor vessel. This robot arm was developed for use in radioactive areas. It can lift heavy weights and do delicate, intricate work. It is controlled remotely by a skilled operator who watches it work on closed circuit television. This optical comparator enables measurements to be made with accuracies of one ten thousandths of an inch. It is used to measure the wear on nuclear fuel. One of the most complex devices in nuclear stations is the fueling machine. It loads and unloads reactors while they're operating. It must cope with the high temperature and pressure of the circulating heavy water. And it must be operated by remote control, for it works in a field of intense radioactivity. For each fuel change, the machine performs more than 40 different operations. It's a far cry from the early models. The first one built weighed 240 tons. This one weighs only 30. The designs and developments made at Sheridan Park have gone into the 250,000 kilowatt power station built with Hydro-Quebec at Gentilly and Ontario Hydro's 2 million kilowatt nuclear plant at Pickering. These and the station at Douglas Point are the first of the large nuclear power plants that will someday dot the country. Soon, much of the electric power for home and industry will come from atomic energy. We have learned to release vast quantities of energy from the atom and to control it for a multitude of practical purposes. But we have only scratched the surface, for atomic science is still young and a promising future awaits us.